A simple conversation around a cup of coffee has led to one of the largest leaps in speaker technology of our generation. Today, you join me for a conversation with Motti, the CEO of Sonic Edge, a company that was founded after disappointment with the sound quality of hearing aids. Until now, high quality audio has been unattainable for tiny speakers like the ones you see in hearing aids, but a new approach where an ultrasonic signal is modulated using an audio frequency signal just like AM, produces pristine audio quality from 20 hertz bass all the way up to 20 kilohertz air. Now, I recommend you stick around and listen to my exclusive interview with Motti and learn how him and his team have brought RF techniques into the audio domain to revolutionize speaker quality in a never seen before form factor. But before we go any further, I'll give you a few seconds to press that subscribe button so you can join me on more chats like this. All right, let's go right into it. Motti. Thank you very much for joining me in the studio today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, let's get right into it. Your approach to generating sound waves is sort of like nothing I've ever heard. And it's just completely different from what's normal. So why don't we start at what's normal? How do we usually generate sound waves? So actually, most speakers today or all speakers today use the same principle. You have a membrane which moves. Mm -hmm. And as it moves, it pushes air, it generates pressure, and this is the sound that we ultimately hear. So a moving membrane yep. generating pressure. Nice. And then, so how does it differ from what your, what your mechanism is? How does your speaker work? So our speaker is based on a different mechanism. We also push air, but we do so at ultrasound frequencies. We work at around 400 kilohertz, 400,000 times a second. We push air. And of course, uh, Normal people can't hear that. Bats maybe, but uh, people can only hear up to 20 kilohertz. So we yeah. generate all this uh, ultrasound and we need to transfer it to audio. We do that with an acoustic modulator. That means above each one of our uh, ultrasound speakers, we have an acoustic channel we can open and close. Now the ultrasound is generating all the pressures we need, high and low pressures, but they're coming out too quickly. So the modulator picks the right pressure at the right time to generate sound from ultrasound. And this is the key feature. So instead of driving a membrane at audio frequencies, we operate a membrane at ultrasound frequencies and then down convert mm -hmm. that signal into audio. So it's very similar in the way it, it functions to, to like an AM signal, right? So you've got a, a high frequency carrier at several hundred kilohertz, 400 kilohertz, um, and you've got some sort of mechanism that is able to uh, just take the envelope of that carrier and turn that into an audible wave. Exactly. You can, uh, the analogy to AM radio is perfect. Great. Hey, maybe I should work here, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So I think... My question with this is, um, okay, you've created a fantastic new speaker. New technologies are always so cool, but the end truth is if you're making a speaker, it's got to sound good, right? So to all the bass heads out there, I ask this simple question, how does it go with bass? And what's the frequency response like? So what uh, you need to understand is wh why start with our speaker? And the, the, our speaker is replacing this standard membrane with essentially a very high speed pump. So we are pushing air 400,000 times a second, as opposed to a standard speaker, which does that around audio frequencies, let's say a thousand times a second. So we have an inherent advantage over a standard speaker. We're replacing the size of the membrane with the speed of the pump. As you go down in frequency, you actually have more time to build up sound pressure. So the unique aspect of our speaker compared to a standard speaker is that as we go down in frequency to the base, we actually have more sound pressure to work with. So in earphone situations, what you would see is a slope, a increasing, uh, uh, increasing sound pressure as you go down in frequencies, and we can go down to very low frequencies, 20 hertz and below, and give much more sound than an existing speaker. At the same time, our speaker does not have any resonances in the system. A typical speaker has resonance at around the, <clears throat> let's say the, the flat area of the speaker starts with a resonance. So that resonance mm -hmm. dominates the speaker performance. Our speaker is a pump. It generates the same airflow 
for 20 hertz or for 20 kilohertz. And that basically means that we have a very well-defined spectrum, which is with constant airflow. And then uh, that uh, translates into a, a constant, uh, <clears throat> constant uh, pressure, which we can use for uh, uh, generating any kind of acoustic signature we want. Amazing. So I guess to give the viewers at home a summary of what's going on is instead of having a membrane, right, and you, you excite it with some sort of um, voltage and it goes, oh, 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 there you go. There's your sound. Watch it go. Cool. This is a thousand kilohertz, right? But my, my, my hands here, which are the membrane, have a, uh, a resonant frequency, right? It's, it's made because of the physical size of my hands going up and down. And typically that is going to be within uh, the human audio hearing, right? between you know, 20 to two to 20,000 kilohertz. And that is what's going to give you a very, with, with other factors, right? Vessel functions, whatever else is included. That is what is going to give you not a very flat frequency range. But because you're generating all the way up in 400 kilohertz, you don't have to bother about any of that resonance. Essentially, there is nothing that could give you not a flat frequency response, correct? It, it really is just like an opening and closing, uh, a control of sound pressure. So, so I would say the picture is slightly more complicated. Uh, in a standard speaker, you have two regimes of operation. You have the constant amplitude regime below resonance. That means the mm -hmm. speaker is moving at a constant amplitude. And actually in that regime, the sound pressure is increasing quadratically because sound pressure is dependent on the quadratic of the frequency. Above resonance, okay. the amplitude drops quadratically, the sound pressure is increasing quadratically, so you have a flat response. So the resonance actually defines when the speaker is used. In a subwoofer, the resonance would be 20 hertz. In a tweeter, the resonance would be four, four kilohertz. So you operate the speaker mm -hmm. above resonance. The resonance has other issues on phase and other aspects. All the issues, all the ripples, all the problems that speakers have are typically additional, uh, let's say, mechanical aspects of getting a membrane moving. And some of these membranes move actually quite a lot and you need to work very hard on the mechanical structure, the envelope, the electric motor to get good consistent movement across all frequencies. And that's why you many times see ripples or other aspects. In our case, we are generating airflow. So you can think of this as a very well-defined pump and everything is happening in very small uh, volumes and very small uh, areas. So we don't have uh, the large membranes, you know, even a small speaker has a membrane several millimeters in diameter and then it's somehow connected. So there are a lot of mechanical elements and a lot of mechanical places where problems can arise. In our case, it's a solid state device. So, you know, it's uh, the equivalent of a computer chip, it can be very complex. Yeah but it's manufactured in a way where you have reliability uh, built into the system. Amazing. So before we're also talking, I just want to move on and talk about some other metrics that matter to us engineers, right? So we have, uh, you know, typically a membrane, like I was saying, which is fluctuating. Uh, this is mechanical energy made, you know, probably inefficiently from electrical energy. Uh, now that we're moving to, or you are moving to an approach that uses a pump, are we going to be seeing improvements in power consumption or is the faster frequencies we're operating at leading to higher losses? So the, we, we are seeing an improvement in power, uh, but the, the main consideration here is really the electrical to acoustic uh, conversion efficiency. Electrical mm -hmm. to mechanical is not too bad, but the mechanical to acoustics is really terrible. And that's because you have a very large membrane and the conversion energy of that membrane into acoustic energy is very low because of uh, basically impedance mismatch. Air is very light, right. membrane is very heavy, there's no relation between them. Turns right, out to our RF they... engineers as well, that's very similar to RF <laughs> impedance as well for anyone who understands exactly. that. And in acoustics, as you go up in frequency, actually the impedance improves. That means when you look at when, when you work at high frequencies, you are get, transferring more efficiently the energy into acoustic energy. And that's really the key issue. So while you have a, a, let's say, transfer of energy at audio frequencies of less than 1%, at ultrasound, you can get 30, 40% of the mechanical energy transferred into acoustic energy. And that's the starting point where we work at. Sure, the 
modulation is of course not 100% efficient. It's not even uh, close to 100%, but still the overall picture, you start from 30%, let's say you, we have just 10% efficiency in the modulation, that's 3%, and that's much better than the standard speaker at less than 1%. Yeah, yeah. So another question I'd have is about, you know, we've got this great, uh, what I would see as an improvement in audio technology, we've got a smaller speaker, a more efficient speaker, a better sounding speaker. Well, is, is there sort of a catch in terms of how complex it is to drive? So I think when it comes to driving a standard speaker, so long as you've got, you know, uh, enough drive out of your amplifier, really all you're providing is a, is a, is a voltage, right? Which is your sound. Yeah. Um, when it comes to your solution, what, what do you need for your speaker? So you've got a 400 kilohertz pump running and you've also got to be giving it some sort of analog waveform uh, that is your audio or is, is that correct? What, what are the inputs to your speaker? So the picture you, you give is, is good. And yes, there is uh, the drive mechanism is more complicated. But keep in mind that, you know, even to drive a standard speaker in a good way, you need to use an amplifier and that amplifier needs to have consistent behavior across the audio frequency. In our case, we also have a dedicated amplifier with, that we designed. And yes, there is a lot of know-how and uh, uh, let's say in, 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 in innovation into, into going into that amplifier. But at the end of the day, it's not drastically different than a class B amplifier that people are using today. So it's a digital, mm -hmm. digital amplifier. We have an input which comes in as an audio signal using standard protocols like uh, I2S or uh, PDM, pulse density modulation. We take that mm -hmm. signal and basically uh, uh, do the algorithm that you mentioned. That means we take an audio signal, we multiply it by a carrier, so it now is riding on 400 kilohertz, and that is riding the signal for, <laughs> for, for, the, the, for, for the speaker component of our device. And then the demodulator is basically driven by the same carrier. So what the device does, it acts like a mixer, like a RF mixer, and mm -hmm. it takes the two inputs and multiplies them. And then the output, the acoustic output is the multiplication output. So essentially, if we have an audio signal times the carrier demodulated by the uh, carrier, we get out the audio signal. There are other ways to implement it, but you know, at a high level, that's what needs to be done. You know, after <laughs> much uh, R and D effort, it's very simple. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, uh, uh, when we sell uh, speakers to customers, we provide the chipset. That means we provide the speaker as a chip, and we provide this uh, amplifier. It's just a two by two millimeter uh, ASIC. We that provide so that as the, as yeah. the as the amplifier for the speaker. Very cool. I like the way that you explained modulation. There, you'll have a signal riding, <laughs> <laughs> riding a higher frequency. I'm sure, the RF engineers will find that funny. Perfect, Monty. Thank you very much for joining. Before we leave today, where can people find out more about you? So first of all, we have our uh, website, uh, Sonic Edge S O N I C E D ge.io not .com, .io. Uh, and there's a lot of information there uh, you can also reach out uh, through the info page uh, you can also look me up at linkedin i'll be happy to answer questions and we also have a, a web on a page on linkedin for the company where we post uh, stuff and updates Amazing. Everyone go add Motti on LinkedIn. <laughs> now, the other thing is, well, uh, here at IP Exchange, we give you a write-up afterwards. We'll have a nice article on ipexchange.tech where you can read more about this. We'll have cool pictures, anything else you need. Other than that, make sure to like, make sure to subscribe, enjoy the video. And as always, stay disruptive. Stay disruptive.